Beijing. My grandfather is used to smog. The day's so humid, heat curls off the pavement like smoke. Here, children cross the streets with masks pressed over mouths. They say now expectant mothers cup their bellies like handfuls of water, afraid babies will spill over. The city pulses. Here is the pet shop, the mangy dogs that tried to bite our hands, the toothless man who reaches out to clasp my arm, rattling his cup of coins. The smell of overripe fruit and gasoline leaking under every wall. At night, my grandfather unlatches every window. We listen to passing cars, the crackle of neighborhood televisions. My grandfather leans over the coffee table with a crossword puzzle, trying on his English. The city presses brittle fingers to its mouth, yearns to contain the hunger that swells inside. Through the windows, we trace no stars. But even in the clasp of darkness, we can see the buildings, blinking still, the strings of headlights groping down the roads. Latchkey Summer. Later, people told me I had the rules wrong. You can't move your kings that way. But it didn't matter then. Those evenings we wild away, honeyed light bent over the chessboard, breathing in tandem. We move alone, you said. No apron mother leaned out the screen door, calling our names. I had your hands to covet when the thunderstorms began. Still, you took my king every time, your sweaty fingers bumping mine, the shimmering air softening to velvet, the lights flickering on in the houses around us, between us, your hands sliding pawns across the dark. Thank you. Erin, you find her touching herself with her eyes open in the back room of the Stiebel her grandfather built, back curled against the fiberboard, knees bent like an offering. She cries out once, you hit her, flat palms and echoing. Shame is louder than ram horns. Ablations for sins, sins she's long stopped counting. You say, remember Onan, but her fingers don't stutter. She tells you it's hard to recall a face she never knew. Blood Psalm 51. She seeds the words to the silence, says, Lotikbox Zivach. You delight not in sacrifice, and spreads her thighs on the marble, red threads clinging like silkworms, floor slick and bruised. The turtle doves laugh, high-pitched and keening, and I chop mandrake roots until my wrist swells, beige heads shuddering like pearls. In the bathroom, she crouches with her lips open. Sound caged by the tile, she whispers a name like a psalm, stillborn. Birdshot. After we've shot the swallows from the sky, I tell you of the coast you've forgotten. Memories turned legend, migrating inwards. I am the gluttony learned by leeching the ocean all swallow bones in winter. Wait with me as I sift through the island. It's almost glass, it's promised spirits. Let me pick these splinters, murmur gentle things. 
let me make you stay. Here are the swallows, and here are their feathers, and here are the phantoms, waiting, wasting. Let us take you to the grotto where the walls glint uh, inwards and the birds drop downwards, lose their faces in the swell. Thank you. Sound of natural running water. Enter Mary and Hannah. They are sisters. Hannah dons a beaver hat. Ain't that the prettiest sight you ever saw? Yeah, but I already seen it before. But don't you just love that glimmer, that shine, the fish? I could do without it. Nothing seems to impress you. You're such an ingrate. I am not. Yard too. Always have been. Ever since you were a little baby, never appreciated nothing. Yes, I have. I appreciate all God's gifts, especially water. I could, do without, I could just do without staring at it for so long and talking about it like it's more than it is. I expect you'd rather discuss your precious Willie. What are you trying to say? He likes you. No, no he doesn't. Then why'd you suppose he gave you that hat? This funny little thing? He just brought it by and gave it to me as a joke. A joke? Yeah. We was laughing about these silly things when he come over to return Daddy's hoe Wednesday. Charlie's daddy walked by with one on and we couldn't stop snickering. He looks so funny. You know Charlie's daddy, big fat fella? Making fun out of the way people look is not kind. I know, but I do enjoy it. He means to make you his wife. Oh my God, are you pulling my leg? No. Wow, I mean, I mean, that's amazing. I love him too, I think. I just never really thought about it before. When does he mean to do this? Tonight. He was gonna ask Daddy if he could take you for a walk after supper. Oh my God. Are you pleased? Very much so. Well, come on in and give your sister a hug. Hannah leans in and embraces her older sister with the energy of an excited child. Mary holds her secure. The hug lasts a while. Hannah tries to get up, but Mary holds on. Mary, come on, let me up. Mary forces Hannah onto her back and begins to choke her. Uh Mary eases slightly. Seeing that you are my sister, I will permit you the choice of your final words. So, I ask you, what will they be? Why are you doing this? Are those them? No! I plan to marry Willie myself one day, but you had to go and lure him in with your whore giggle. You can have him, and all his land. You can have him, just let me live, please. I will have him, but you have no right to live, and I will not show mercy to you when you show no mercy for my heart. How could you not tell? Mar uh! Mary squeezes, Hannah struggles, Hannah stops struggling. Mary sits back and breathes. There's a pause, and then she puts her sister's hat on and stands. Perhaps you will appreciate the water more as a resident of its beauty rather than a spectator. Blackout and splash sound. When Melissa died, my daddy flushed her down this toilet. He said it goes to fish heaven. I'm going to flush you down the same toilet so you can be in the same part of fish heaven. That way, it'll be easier for you to find her. When you do, I want you to tell her I miss her. Tell her daddy misses her too. Sometimes he still cries about it. Say, you were loved, Melissa, loved to death. She would probably laugh at that. Tell her I wish I had been there to say goodbye. Tell her I'm sorry if the toilet water was too cold or too warm when she was flushed. She deserved nothing but the best. But most importantly, please tell her that I didn't replace her. She kept me company when she was alive, and she probably thinks that I got another fish as soon as she died. I bet she thinks that fish is named Melissa too, and I'm watching it swim right now. But even thinking about replacing her feels wrong. I'd much rather be lonely than betray an old friend. We were too close for me to just move on like that. Did you get all of that? Please don't forget anything, and please enjoy fish heaven. Girl flushes the toilet. 
Water circles the toilet bowl and the dead fish spins in the current, limp like a rag doll. As the water recedes, the fish is pulled under. The flush is complete. There is no more water in the toilet bowl, no more dead fish. The girl gets up and walks to the bathroom, into her bedroom. Interior girl's bedroom, night. The girl walks into the door to her bedroom. Like the rest of the apartment, the floor is white tile. Her bed is plain and fitted with pink sheets. The room's decor seems too childish. It does not suit her. She opens a large wooden armoire and changes into her pajamas quickly and silently. She climbs into the bed and pulls the comforter up to her chin where she turns to the bedside table on which there is an empty fishbowl and a framed picture of the girl with her mother. She reaches out to touch it. Good night. Fade to black. Excerpt from Long Beach. It is summer 2004. We are all lighting sparklers in the backyard at Grandpa's house. Late July and the mosquitoes are everywhere. I rake my nails painted pink over the bites covering my knees. Sierra has just turned 16. She is sitting in a beach chair on the concrete patio holding a cell phone that we marvel at, open and close with our sugar and dirt covered fingers when she isn't looking. 16 and she is just learning how to properly hide the hickeys using makeup. When we play in her bedroom, she pushes the vodka bottles further underneath her bed. She is trying to protect us from something. I am nine and Brooke is seven. We run across the tiny backyard, sparklers glowing between our fingertips, singing the lyrics to the songs we watch obsessively on VH1 when our mothers are at work or asleep. The English feels funny in our mouths and none of the elders understand, which makes the songs feel electric, alive. Nine years old and already they don't understand what I'm saying. Nine years old and already I am being birthed from the belly of America. This other woman, her fingernails digging into the flesh of my upper arms. Sierra sits us on her bed and tells us to close our eyes, dusts our eyelids with blue powder, smears a tube of red across our lips. I open my eyes and Brooke does too. She is smiling, laughing into the mirror that Sierra holds up to her face. But when I get a chance to look, I feel a balloon of hope bursting within me. I wanted the makeup to make me somebody else, but I am the same stupid girl, and now the makeup feels stupid, too. Smile, Gracie. You're so pretty when you smile, Brooke says, holding a dusty mirror up to my face. I smile, even though I don't want to, so that Brooke's feelings don't get hurt. I study my own face in the mirror, two rows of tiny teeth, poking through the crimson. An excerpt from Cousin Sarah who knows everything and wears makeup for New York boys. <laughs> Cousin Sarah is very pretty. Her hair is straight and blonde, her teeth never needed braces, and she doesn't have ugly glasses like me. Even though mom says that she is at the age when girls get red dots on their foreheads, Sarah doesn't have any, and yet she still colors her lips with red marker and traces her eyes with colored pencils. She only does this when she is visiting because she says the boys are cuter here. I think the boys in fourth grade at my school are disgusting, but I don't think those are the boys that she's talking about. Cousin Sarah is a junior cheerleader. She is on a team in Albany, and she loves to do the dances and splits in front of my family while I sit there and try to think of any talents I have. Cousin Sarah has a new boyfriend every time I see her. She asks me, did I tell you about Brian? And I say, what happened to Max? And she says, Max got boring and acne. In some ways, Sarah is a lot like her father. One day, Uncle Peter and Cousin Sarah come to visit us alone, and I ask, where's Aunt Iris? And Sarah collapses into my shoulders. Cousin Sarah has never cried in front of me. I hold her close and rub her back because I know that people don't like trying to talk through their tears. After a few minutes, she mumbles into my shoulder that they broke up, and I can't ask why because I start to cry too. Cry for Iris's sweet smile and Uncle Peter's eyes when he looked at her, and for all of Cousin Sarah's almost parents. 
She tells me that he is going to live at Andy's house and that Andy is short for Andrea and I feel older because I know what it means. She says, all I want is a family. She asks, why can't I have one? And I want to say, because, Cousin Sarah, you're pretty and blonde, and you get a new text message every other minute, and you've had 27 boyfriends, and everyone likes you, and you could do backflips, and you've discovered more talents this month than I have my whole life, and you can't have everything. But I don't say this. Because my nine-year-old self is realizing that I don't want to be Cousin Sarah, and I don't want to be sitting in a nursing home 70 years later asking why I wasted all this time trying to fix myself. All of this should make me happy. And it is a load off my shoulders, but I feel empty because when I was little, everyone wanted to, me to be perfect and it was drilled into me so deeply since birth, be perfect, be perfect, be perfect, that when I tried to dig it out, I just felt a gaping hole. So instead, we simply sit there, the blonde and the nerd crying because Cousin Sarah isn't perfect. An excerpt from Paradiso. I was there when F. Kaminsky fell. He was looking at me and I stopped to stare back. We watched each other, standing perfectly still. Then he raised the can of gasoline, presenting it to me with arm outstretched. Truth be told, at that point, I was sure it was some kind of performance art. And I remained, holding my breath. He lifted the can above his head and closed his eyes, bathing his face in the rising sun. Then he began to pour. First, I watched the glistening waterfall crash downwards, following the line of his arm. And then I watched it collide with his face, droplets scattering in the cool, vibrant air. He drenched himself in gasoline. And then he looked at me again, eyebrows raised, his other hand came up slowly in front of his face, and he pressed it against his drooping lashes. I thought at first that he was touching his cheek, but when the lone spark hit his eyelid and he went up, I understood with chemical clarity what had happened. His hair burned away before anything else, and bald and lashless, he looked more like a baby than a man. After that, he fell. As he drifted downward, he looked at me with sympathy, and I saw that his blue eyes were flecked with red. Perhaps some veins had popped. I looked away just as he hit the ground. The police were there almost before impact. I had to give a statement, and that was all right, but the reporters exalted me, and that was excellent. Suddenly, I was the oracle, the authority on what had he done before going up in flames? How had he acted? What did I think he was thinking? In front of the camera and in print, telling my version of events, I felt the wind on my face and fame tapping at my shoulder. I was not a party to the fall, not even an accessory, but the oracle of his last moments. Every inch of magnificence he attained by flame, I attained simply by proximity. There was glory in his death, enough to go around. Thank you. An excerpt from Francis. Her father is not how she remembers him. He is too tall and too skinny. He smells like dirt and beer in his baggy suit. Nevertheless, the sight of him after all this time excites Francis and she reaches out to hug him. He pats her head, a worried look on his face. The assistant principal whispers something urgently to the principal. The principal yells out, Hello, Mr. Dutton. I hope this is not inconvenienced to you. The father nods and tells the principal he does not need to bother with small talk and that he did not know his information was written in the school ledger. I think it is best for Francis to take the rest of the day off. You were the person she wanted to see. The assistant principal speaks uneasily, making sure not to look at the father's eyes, but at the space between his eyebrows. Her father does not seem to listen to either of them as he lifts Frances up off the ground and puts her small frame over his shoulders. Frances is examining the tiles on the ceiling, running her thumb along the indentations. He hums the tune to a new song he learned on the recorder, all repeated notes and long pauses. 
kicked out on the first day of school. Isn't that something? Her father marvels. He had always encouraged Frances's naughtiness. I'll let her mother know about this as soon as I find a payphone. He swoops Frances off his shoulders and tells her to collect her things. She runs out the door, and the three adults can hear her umbrella clinging against the lockers. He stares at the two dumbfounded principals. Yes? They ruffle their shirt collars, check their watches, do anything to make the father's appearance as normal as possible. She will be safe. Don't worry, the father reassures them. Frances barges back into the office. Her book bag is hiking up her skirt in the back, exposing her day of the week underpants. It is Monday, but the underpants say otherwise. Her father lets out a snort-like laugh. Same old Frances. He grabs her pale little hand, and they are off into the rain. Thank you. To said none back. That's when she told me. Six years old, watching mommy cry at the edge of the bathtub. Splash, splash. I'm unhappy, mommy says. Splash, a teardrop falls. My fingers trembled as I unpeeled the layers of onion that covered my childhood. I watched our bridge fall down, remembering that time when mommy cried, that time when mommy yelled, that time when mommy, that time when mommy, that time when mommy, mommy, mommy. We are two souls floating in the ocean of betrayal. To sink would be to accept the truth as we know it. To keep swimming will tire us out immensely. Imagine the energy it would require to go on confused, lost, navigating rough waves and large expanses of nothing but blue. I am afraid of the threat of what's beneath us, the truth in the form of jellyfish or sharks. My phone buzzes again. It's my mom. I love you a lot, and we had a misunderstanding. I am sorry. I click the lock button and slide my phone back into my pocket. I walk to a bench and sit down, taking in the brick columns that support the automobiles whizzing over me. Brick by brick by brick, a leg is formed, a leg to hold the road, a road to transport the people. I study the cracks in between and wonder what would happen if I slide one out, and another, and another. Would the whole thing come crashing down? In times when it feels like everything is falling apart, we begin to see the bricks that support us as experiences with a whole new meaning, and we may believe that our path has been a foggy version of the truth. I pull my phone out and stare at my text conversations with her. I slide it up and down, watching the text bubbles hop and bounce against the invisible boundaries of a touchscreen world. I love you a lot. Me too, mommy. I love you too. The pain I see in my mother's eyes is a call to arms for me to love her even more. It is a call for me to love her to the moon and back. No, to said none back. It is a call for me to dive into that ocean of jellyfish and sharks because they may be painful, but I'd risk a bite in the ass to save the woman I love more than life itself. <laughs> 